Out of your league, we go again and we go all Australian with our very special guest this week. And when we think Australia, what comes to mind? Helen Daniels, Madge and Harold, Kylie and Jason, Crocodile Dundee, those stupid hats with dangling corks, the cheating David Warner, disgusting Foster's beer. But did you know that Australians get more snow in the Australian Alps than they do in Switzerland. If you visit a new beach in Australia every day, it would take you over 27 years to see them all. Australians developed a fake animal to scare tourists even more. The drop bear was created by mainstream institutions and was claimed to drop from trees and attack tourists. There is no drop bear. Per capita, Australians spend more money on gambling than any other nation. Australia is the home to the longest fence in the world, 5,614 kilometres. Each year, Brisbane hosts the World Championships of Cockroach Racing. Cockroach Racing. Australia has three times more sheep than people. And an Australian man once tried to sell New Zealand on eBay. Welcome to Out of Your League, one of the greatest to ever play the game. The Guana is coming to Super League, all 1 meter 96 of GI, aka Gregory Paul Inglis. Welcome to Out of Your League, Greg. How are you? Okay, boys, thanks for having me. <clears throat> Going pretty good, actually. Uh, you know, got part, got through out of the snow bit, and um, so that's all good. Just uh, seeing a little bit of sunshine. It's not, you know, we everyone's cheering over here. It's a top of twelve, and you know I'm still walking around in trackies and a hoodie and beanie. <laughs> so, <laughs> um, look, it's uh, it's exciting to to be quite honest. It's it's exciting and it's, um, something that you know um, won't happen again. To to be honest, Greg, is there any other Australian Australian facts that you can give us as well? Just on top of that, that little intro. Oh, <clears throat> uh, look, there is. Uh, that fence you're talking about, you know, that's got some significant history behind it. Um, they call it the rabbit-proof fence. Um, it's, you know, it's pretty much in the middle of Australia. And um, you're right about the beaches. To take it, you know, if you was to visit every single beach around, um, it will take you quite quite some years to do it. Um, in terms of the the drop bear, um, yeah, it is a made-up creature, but it's, it's on the back of a koala, but... Yeah, they don't drop out of <laughs> they don't drop out of uh, trees and that. Um, I think we got a reporter. I think one there was an interview and the reporters came up, and we t I think uh, one of the re reporters um, who was reporting it actually told her to put all this headgear on, put this um, like a baseball guard on and everything, gloves and everything. So <laughs> she's um, <laughs> yeah, we stitched her up pretty good. Will's never been to Australia, as you can tell, so he just relies on Wikipedia for all these facts and information. Yeah, exactly. He was reading it off a off a computer there, wasn't he? Yeah. <laughs> what he what he didn't do justice, Greg, is in your introduction, it you know, he touched on you as a as a guy. I think well, I speak for for everybody in the UK to 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 have you come over and play in Super League is massive and you know, I know I speak for me and Mark, who are players, and Will, who doesn't know fuck all about rugby league. When I say, mate, it's to have you over in this country, you know, one of the all-time great rugby league players to 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 see you playing over in this country it, it is massive and it's huge. And and uh, just tough out that cold weather, to keep that tracksuit on, mate, because I want to see you be running around in a few months' time. <laughs> yeah. Well, like, yeah, I've I've been over here on tours and that, and you know. It's, I think the longest we've been over here was nine weeks in World, World Cup year. And, but in between those, it was just the four nations coming over here for the experience with Melbourne and South Sydney as well. And, you know, it's just, um, I've seen this as a perfect opportunity to actually play a full season over here. And, um, you know, it's a pity that we're not going to have fans full, you know, stacked to the, because um, I know how quite, quite, quite loud they can be especially when you're in an Australian jersey. So, you know, it'd be, it'd be good to get cheered on for once. It's difficult doing a, a podcast, Greg, isn't it? In four different boxes, we're all in different cities and so on, but we'll we'll tough it out. Look, Wilco said it there as well. It's so exciting to have you, you know, out of retirement. Can't wait to watch you this season. I know the Warrington fans are absolutely 
uh, you know, having sleepless nights over it. Um, look, you've done it all, Greg, and I know you've you've answered this question a thousand times as well since you, the announcement was made. But what do you have to prove? Um, to be honest, I'd, it doesn't actually nothing comes to mind. But, you know, I see this opportunity as a uh, you know playing for Warrington, and you know Warrington's always been in the top four. You know, the past couple of years, and I see it as a challenge from for myself to actually come over and add, you know, value to this team and to the to the club itself, um, the squad, I mean. And, you know, I just see it as a perfect opportunity to actually pass on. Back home, I do a bit of coaching with the juniors and, you know, it's, like I said, um, like I just touched on, <clears throat> pass on my knowledge of the game to the young and up-and-coming guys through our academy squads and, you know, hopefully just pass, you know, pass on some knowledge, some knowledge up, to them guys so you know I'm not a, just only here as a player yes I want to play games and I want to you know be successful as well but also away from the footy field is you know help guys if they ever want to come test themselves out over in the Australian you know in the NRL is actually test on pass on my knowledge to them so they can actually try and test themselves in the NRL as well. And I'm, I'm quite interested to know to know these last couple of years Greg since you retired from um, the South Sydney Rabbitohs. Like, what's what's been your thirst like for 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 wanting to play again? What really drove you to kind of take up this deal with Warrington? Um, I, I think it was just knowing in myself that you know when I retired, I wasn't in a great headspace, but also my body was given up. You know, I was playing under 18s at the age of 15 years old. So you know, over. Number number of years, its body just takes its toll, and you know, male adult males don't really the bodies don't really develop until they're twenty five, twenty six. So you know, getting the battering and everything from that from early age, you get playing against men uh, at the age of fifteen. So, but coming out of that, going through you know struggles away from the footy field, in you know just within myself, but and coming out of that at the you know, seen a lot in the tunnel with that. It's I felt like I just had that little bit more to give. Um, I wasn't looking to return to the NRL, and then it just came from a conversation with with Jason Clark, and everything went on from there. So to come over here, I just like I said, like I keep touching on, and I just want to add value to this club. You know, me personally, I, I know what what I can do and what I can get back to doing. It's just um. You know, taking small steps. I've been out of the game for two years, and it's just taking small steps to get there. Before we look back, Greg, let's look forward then. And you just mentioned it there. You've been out of the game for two years. Is it is it realistic to think that you can get back to your best at thirty four? Um, <clears throat> I wouldn't say at my ultimate best. Um, you know, like like I said, been out of the game for two years had time for the body to heal and it's just getting through, you know, a long season over here. Um, but, you know, in saying that, it's it's also up here in the head about getting around to it and actually doing it, doing it right and being smart about it. Mm. Look, there's so, much, so much well, to, though, talk about, about, uh, to talk about. About your body, sorry, Will, just on, on that. You know, when you're a young man, you, you, your body can – do an awful lot and, and, and Greg would be an example of that way where his physical body as a younger man can, can do an awful lot. The, f- the frustrating thing I think I found as well at the back end of my career is that your mind is sharp, that you you know the game, like you have learnt so much from the repetition of, of playing in games and all of that knowledge is, is inside you but you know your body just sometimes can't quite do what it used to do and, and, and you know I think when Greg talks about being at his best, it, we've got to split that into two sides, like physically at his best or, or mentally, you know, at, at the peak of his knowledge and his powers. And, you know, I'd say the Greg that we'll see will, will, will be physically in, in shape to play, but it's more so that knowledge and, and that learned experience from just the repetition of playing. Like if you start playing rugby, you start playing at six, seven, eight years old. And by the time you're 18, 20, you've, you, you've, You've played an awful lot of rugby already, and 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 you know physically your body breaks down over time, but certainly your mind's sharp, and that's where Warrington 
I think will gain gain the benefit of, of Greg's influence, and and it's certainly maybe not that physical side that was once absolutely your you know your thing, Greg. But but you know that that the learning of such a long period in the game will be valuable to those around you, without doubt. Yeah, and that's <clears throat> you know I'll say that as a benefit, and that's what I touched on before is like adding value to the to the team. It's like just giving different scenarios and you know the vision i can see for a video or you know what what not and just give them little cues of what look for in different players and you know just just general football knowledge um like he's touched on it's just repetition repetition and you can never get enough of of doing that for you know it's just, just going to come back into you know just the little things during the game making the smart decisions during the game and you know just being smart on their footy field now especially after being out for two years. It's an interesting one, this, Greg, because you're talking to two guys here with Mark and Flat and uh, Wilco that have hung up their boots in the last sort of six months. But how difficult was it for you? How difficult was life for you when you retired in 2019? Yeah, it was... Um, <clears throat> I thought I had everything all sorted, but, you know, because I've been in the game for so long and, you know, it's... When you, you know, having a chat with Wayne Bennett, he's, he was saying to me before, you know, actually this hap- this came out, it was like, make sure you find, you know, um, regular routine on a daily basis. And because we've been programmed and been around in this structured life for so long, you knew where to go, you knew what to wear, you knew exactly what, you know, what, what meal you was eating when you was going away on trips. So to get that, down pat and then just to be programmed, wake up, or right, I've got to wake up this we've got a session at nine, we've got to be there at eight, get strapped, get treatment, whatnot, <clears throat> to actually waking up and oh, I've got to be at work at 10, so I'll just doodle in at nine, you know, and it's like, oh, I can go out and stay up, stay up for a bit longer. <clears throat> you don't, you're not really taking care of yourself, you know, sleep-wise, health-wise, and I found that pretty hard for myself when I first retired, and especially in that first year. You know, yeah, I had a job there lined up our house, and but it was just I wasn't used to sitting behind a computer screen and you know being pulled left, right, and you know I was doing four fourteen hour days, you know, last year helping out our juniors and our first grade side. So that kept me back in the balance of life, and you know, just really seeing the inside of what's it like at you know when you step away from there from that actual. You know, everyday grind um, in the footy world to actually do everyday grind in the corporate coaching world. You, you've been um, you've been diagnosed recently, I think, in the last couple of years with with bipolar, bipolar two. Which you know, I just want to make that point first, and we'll get to that. But rewinding before your diagnosis, you had that ACL injury, Greg, in in twenty seventeen, and it led you down um, a pretty dark road, didn't it, at Souths? Yeah, yeah, without a doubt. And, you know, I talk about, you know, I talk about this when I present my, you know, my story to, you know, kids or audience. Um, I'll go around to um, schools now and speak to corporate guys back home um, just about, I started this thing I call the Goanna Academy and it's just talking about my story about the mental health. And, you know, we do touch on that, you know, from being, I didn't really know what was going on until actually the ACL and then all through, then that just spiraled out of control all the way, you know, pretty much down to the darks. You know, I went to rehab twice, really didn't diagnose until my second rehab stink, which was, you know, until you get that, until you get the right diagnosis, well, then you know what's going on and it helps your mind at ease. But, you know, drinking and taking prescription drugs, staying up out of routine, just, you know, we were ACL, sit down home for, you know, two months of doing anything and then just mixing that with prescription drugs and alcohol. It's not a it's not a good mix at all and, you know, it can actually lead to the worst. And lucky enough for me, I got hold of it really quick and I had a good support network around me to actually seek help. Do do you think as a as a very as a very high profile player in Australia, the public scrutiny and the media attention makes a situation like you went through much worse? Yeah, but <clears throat> when you're in that in that life for so long, you just learn to block it out. 
and that's what I've done um, for so long. And you know, papers are there to sell papers, and they'll write anything that they want um, just to sell, just to sell the papers and make them look good. So, you know, I knew, like I touched on before, that I had the right support network around me. I had the right people around me to actually that I can actually go talk to and you know help help me and you know I can actually be allow myself to be vulnerable to talk about my deeper issues and I still have those connections today and you know if, it's not until you go through you know the darkest periods of your life that you actually know the right people around you to have the right people around you yeah, I think look, what one of the things that the media love to do, and, and I think they they do this with 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 football players over here, uh, you know, certainly with the NRL players, is is the and also other sports like athletes, um, you know, all all sorts of people is they create this false perfection behind the stars, like they want people to be perceived as being perfect, and and the reason for that is that it makes good headlines when things are going well. But also, it gives them something to fucking write about when things don't go well for somebody, and it's like opportunist from the media to project, like project sports people as 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 like models of perfection. It's just nonsense. Like we've everybody has their vices, and we've all got our own stuff going on. And like the pressure, I feel that the sport and sports put on sports people to act perfect can make you actually feel so disassociated from who you actually are. Like, I, I love a drink and, I, you know, I, I, I applied myself in my career, but I also got loads of shit wrong. Like, I, I got so much wrong. But all the time in the background, you're sort of being portrayed as sort of semi-perfect and your family look at you and think that you're ultimately really disciplined. And, you know, I had sides of my personality that had darkness to them and, and were in the shade. But the media make a big job of, portraying you as perfect so that when it comes to the point they can cut your legs off and shoot you down it makes news and 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 look in the nrl greg that's that's commonplace isn't it we're very lucky in super league we don't really see that a lot but in the nrl you can't put a foot wrong no you can't especially around anything you do in the nrl whether it's you know it's coming to that stage now whereas if you're part of the first grade side but you're not playing first grade but you're still in that in that 30, well, then your name's, you know, if you, you know, muck around them, well, then that's when you start getting a poor name before you actually get to your first grade. But, you know, there's a lot of good things that players do, um, athletes do, but they just don't get right, written about because it doesn't sell papers. And it's unfortunate, but, you know, that's what, that's what, that's how it is. And I think that's expected from the media at times, that kind of perfection, like, like John alluded to. But, I think to play at rugby league and to play at the highest level, you need a certain kind of personality to do the stuff that rugby players do, which is run into a brick wall of defenders or to make 50 tackles a game or to push your body to do certain things. That You've got to have a certain makeup and to expect that personality to also be without flaw off the field is just impossible. And I don't think it's ever going to going to be the case where that's, that, that's common. Yeah, and... There's another thing I speak about, you know, when I do deliver my stories, it's like, yes, I, I, I strive to be perfect. You know, that's what we all want. We all want to be the perfect footballer. We all want to be the perfect off field. We all, we all want to do this here. But reality is that shit's never going to happen. No one is perfect. You know, that's just the bottom line of it. But I also talk about, you know, what made me realise and hopefully everyone else too is you know, failure. Allow yourself to fail so you can actually learn from you from your shit mistakes that you made and then move on from it. You know, there's, there's no point having regrets because there's no point being somebody else that people want to make that want to make you. Be the person you want to be and craft your own person around, you know, who you really are in at the end of the day. Because in the, the day you gotta fall asleep with you know, either with your partner or you got to put your head on the pillow and, you know, you got to be happy within yourself. You know, it doesn't mean you have to be absolutely absolute dickhead um, 24-7, but, you know, that's just that's just who the media make us to be, make, make, out, make us out to be is perfect, but we're not. But before your diagnosis, Greg, um, 
you you were suffering from depression and I guess look, I get, we'll, we'll get to the, the diagnosis and whether it was a relief later but you were just suffering from depression and you had these severe mood swings try and try and describe to someone who's never experienced that what that was like yeah so the second like I said you've got to get the right diagnosis and then it will just make sense within yourself because you go oh actually you go back into a time you go yeah that's what I was feeling at the moment at that time in my life and but yeah I've got mood swing um, bipolar 2 disorder depression and anxiety and just having a mood swing you know it can be come in the morning and you can be upbeat and then by the one o'clock you just hit a wall and just come down you don't want to talk to anybody you just you know that's how I felt and it's you can go from one scale to the other like very quick you know you could be sitting there having a small conversation but you know i could do it just comes on like that it could happen after this year after i finish with you guys and walk um drive home my partner could ring up and say oh how was it but i just give could give her nothing you know you just don't know when it's going to happen but when you when it does happen now especially for myself and my partner knows the signs of it we just sit there she allows me over my five minutes or what whatever and then we just start conversations back up again then i'll go back and visit what what she what the question was about was, was this what got you in in i wouldn't say trouble because I, I don't know the facts but you know when you were younger and i'm talking back you know to sort of early days at melbourne storm and, and you came across a, a friend and, and mentor who's been great a great part of your life um adrian coolwell and and he was in the police force and he showed you the the watch house and i guess he kind of showed you a life that you realized very very quickly that a, a, a trail a path that you didn't want to go down when, when you were that young you probably didn't understand what was what was going on what was making you get into these random fights what was making you drink what was making you in theory a bad person yeah so i moved away from home at the age of you know at the end of the age of 15 going on 16 with the newcastle first time actually being away from you know living away from home and going out getting the fights um still but still going out the footy footy training and playing footy on the weekends but in between that there was getting in the fights going out drinking and just you know just driving around in cars till about two three o'clock in the morning and you know you can't sustain that lifestyle and it wasn't until i went back to brisbane and like you said it's adrian corwell took me into the watch house showed me it and it was very it was, it was very frightening to be honest and sitting there and seeing it was just quiet but seeing all these these people in there that you just know that's in there for doing bad things and you just don't want to be in that place you know it's it's very airy and scary at the same time was that a wake-up call to you that that experience oh massively yeah massive wake up call and I reckon that was the best thing that's happened to me because or oh, one one of the best things that's happened to me like I said I was in that cycle of just going out drinking driving around in cars and getting the fights not really applying myself to training or to school and you know skipping school and just you know forging letters saying that you know that I didn't that I was sick and which was bullshit I was just in the car going up the going up to the beach and enjoying a sunny day um you know you just going in there and seeing that and adrian just said this is the life you can have if you keep going down this path or you can actually make something of yourself at that time i i didn't really know how far i could go in my football career and you know that was a turning point pretty much from a football wise perspective yeah, Greg. At that point, you know, you you're a young athlete, very talented. You know, there's there's a lot of talk about you being a prospect. Were you aware of your condition then? You know, way prior to your diagnosis, was that something that you were, was aware of right back then, or or did you sort of after the event get to the conclusion you've always had it? Yeah, it wasn't until my second stint rehab. Um, well touched on before is when you come out of that and you like you're in rehab and your psych's talking to you about you know diagnosia then you go back in your in your life and you actually think about it and it's like all right this is what happened at this time i remember this you know you re- remember significant events 
that's happened throughout you throughout your life or throughout your career and you go shit that's actually how it happened and that's what that's what it is that's what it was so yeah i think it's right there and then it doesn't you know you don't know because it wasn't spoken about back then and where now it's especially now in this covid in this pandemic that we're all living in it's quite frightening and alarming what what's happening with these young kids you know they can't interact you know when we was growing up that's all you did you was outside kicking the footy around or running around riding bikes and but now these poor kids and even adults are sitting at home doing zoom calls you just it just is what it is and you know um it's unfortunate but can't help it greg i've watched a lot of interviews with you and uh, one theme that comes up quite a lot is you, you talk about toxic people in your life. Like, I'm not expecting you to, to start naming them, but what, what impact did these people have on you? Um, I think it was just, I, I guess it was just misleading. And, you know, when we talk about, you know, applying yourself to, to training and um, applying yourself away from footy field, it was, I think I just fell in the trap of, you know, if no one's looking, I could actually get away with a little bit more away from the footy field. And, you know, it was just, I think it was a whole, whole array of people, to be honest, that, that was around me at the time. And it wasn't until my second rehab stink that when you actually go through it, you realise that the people who really care about you will always support you. And not good. They, they're, still, they're still there today. You know, I could still bring them up and rely on these these people in my life now and actually talk to it, actually tell them actual honest truth about how I'm feeling and what I'm thinking and what's what's going on in my life. Mm. That that moment then, and we mentioned the diagnosis. Let's let's get to that point. When when you sat down in front of a professional, who said to you, "Greg, you've got bipolar two. Was that a, a, a moment of relief was that where you could justify everything and talk us through that day and what it felt like well <clears throat> we're sitting like you said we're sitting down having you know this couple of presentations um you know over a course of two months and it wasn't until after that there that he actually diagnosed me with it and that day i drove home and on my way home i was just thinking about you know how how something so I wouldn't say simple, but you know that was just there in front of me that I didn't recognise it, but it was always there. You know from an early age, and it's just never been never actually got addressed until, like, like I said, my one one of my good mates that looked after me was actually he said there's there's more than what's going on with this drinking and that you you need to go see someone and that's what i did but that day where i actually got diagnosed it was just what it was just de-stress and i was just oh this is so so good and i'm so glad that this has happened and how have your relationships um developed and changed with those around you since since the diagnosis greg Oh, they they've changed dramatically. But in saying that, I just know who to actually trust and talk to um, about the deep underlying issues going on in my life and what I'm thinking about. And then there's other guys that, or I wouldn't say guys, just other people around that you know that's you know in my life that you know it's just sort of scratching the surface. Really, it's like you know just seeing how you're going. Yeah, yeah, no, everything's all good, and you know just. Um, yeah, it's just that. But in terms of having relationships, you know, away from the footy field, I think it's been the best that, that I've ever had in my, in my life. I, I imagine it would have helped you so much more, Greg. And look, hindsight's a wonderful thing, isn't it? But had you got a diagnosis as a teenager, you would have had a very, I mean, you had a, an unbelievable career and, and you're a happy man now and your relationship and everything. But it could have been very different when during those dark, dark moments for you. Yeah, it, it definitely could have, but, you know, I said it before, there's, there's no point having regrets about it. 
I'm glad I was going through that there stuff at that stage, looking back on it now, because I wouldn't be sitting here and talking about what I've, you know, what I'm doing now. And you know, you, we all come from different parts of the world, all different walks of life. But you know, as um, you know, as footballers, we all have that one common goal, and, um, or rugby, as you call it over here, is one common goal is to actually strive and be perfect and want to be there at the big dance at the end of it. Um, and it's, it's just, to, it is what it is for me, and I can't help that. You know, that's the way I'm programmed, and that's the way, you know, my genetics are. But I just, I can't help what I've done in the past. All I can do is just touch on it now and where I want to go in the future. It, and look, the great thing about, uh, well, I say it's, it sounds crazy to say the great thing about bipolar, but the great thing about the condition that you have is that it is very treatable. How, and, and like, I, I know you're on medicine and you still have to be, and you said earlier, Greg, that you could switch like that in the afternoon. You still have to maintain your, your levels and you know how to do that now. But how, do, do you have to allow yourself to be vulnerable to be helped? Yeah, yeah, without a doubt. If you don't allow yourself to actually open up and, you know, it took me... I think three days in the clinic to actually like actually open up like and honestly open up and you have to allow yourself to be vulnerable otherwise you won't get the best out of yourself and you can't get the right help but you know touching on medication I'm only on one tablet a day and I take one tablet a day and I've got to do that for the rest of my life it is what it is but I'd rather take that one tablet instead of just going through my shit mood swings and you know, that way it can just break up, you know, the relationships around me with my family, with my friends and with my partner. I'd rather just take that one tablet and, and do that then and live a happy. I found it interesting, Greg, when uh, the guy said you were going to come on and I was like, obviously did, did did a bit of looking around and obviously, you know, once you get past the YouTube clips of you, of you bashing people out of the way, scoring tries and stuff, there's, 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 you know, you get onto this part of your career and, and, and inevitably, look, you know, we I could talk to you all day about the rugby side, but people are interested in this. And one thing I found actually when I started reading about the condition is like a day in the life of a rugby player actually is almost like mirrors the, the condition that Greg has. You have like a really intense social sort of interaction period and then you know, you might be wrestling and then you finish for the day and then you're flat and then your week is a build up to a weekend and then you play and then you have a drink and then you're flat. And I was like, man, like if the fact that this man did what he did with maybe some of those issues in the background shows you what an incredible, you know, world-class once in a lifetime sort of player that we're talking about. Because the, 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 the entire cycle of rugby is that boom or bust? You 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 are around the lads, then you're on your own at home on your couch. You know you're building up to a big game, you play, and then you know you wake up on a Monday morning, and everybody's on their own on a Monday morning. And especially when you throw you throw a drink in, prescription meds in, you start to throw all these things that are associated with teams and a, 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 of sports culture, whether whether you like it or not. And if I go back to the start of my career, you know. We'd, we'd go on benders on a Friday night. We'd play Fridays and we'd go out Friday night. We'd go out Saturday, we'd go out Sunday and we'd roll in on a Monday in, in terrible like shape. And that, looking back at that part of my life, I was like, Jesus, um, it's exhausting. And, and, and rugby league can be, can be exhausting. And it just made me think, I wonder how much team sports and the environment play into that condition, Greg. You know, are, are they... Was it helpful being around a team or, or or did it encourage those bad habits? Well, I'm like a, I'm only speaking on what I've experienced and I can only speak for myself, but being in that environment probably helped mask it, probably helped me mask the way I was feeling, the way I was carrying myself. You know, you can actually hide a little bit in the team environment, you know, oh, how are you feeling today? It's mask on. Yeah, no worries. I'm feeling top. Um, but really, it's like, oh, fuck, I actually got to get up and, you know, do an hour fitness session here. It's like, how am I going to do that? And you just feel sluggish. Um, so and I felt being in that team environment actually helped me mask it a bit. And, you know, when you come out of 
when you come out if you and I finished up, it I just couldn't help it, but it was, you know, people around me recognizing different things and different because I was around them a lot more instead of just going to, you know, South Sydney training, you know, coming home at three, four and then it's like, yeah, okay, dinner's dinner's ready or we can go play golf or whatnot and just get out of the house where um some and then other days it was day off all right let's go do something and i'll be like no i just want to sit on the couch and they i wouldn't move from the couch so and then the next day rolling the training and it's like bang yep i can flick it on here i can do this and you know when it's downtime in between sessions it's like downtime but then it's like getting back up to it so in terms of being around a team environment helped me i think it helped me mask it a, a lot better Greg, why do you think there is such a stigma around mental health still in, in 2021, especially for men and especially, I guess, for sportsmen? Look, I, no one knows the right answer for that. I feel like it's just the way we've been brought up, you know, especially the older generations. It's just, it is what it is. No one wanted to talk about it. You know, you didn't want to go and see your friend about it because they'll think that you're weak, especially in, you know, in the rugby environment that we play in. You just don't want to be seen as that weak person because, you you know, you want to be picked in the side. It's like, oh, how are you feeling today? Oh, you're not, not too great. And it's like, well, your player's going to look at you. Your teammate's going to look at you. Well, this is what you think about it anyway. Actually, he's going to think of me about this and he doesn't have full trust in me, so he won't pick me in the side. But I want to play first grade. So you don't really open up about it. And, you know, growing up, I'd, you know, your dad or your pop would just slap you on the back and go, that's all right, dust it off. Away you go. So, you know, I think it's just the way we've been brought up. And, you know, I think, also think what's helping now with these younger generations is we can actually talk about it. And, you know, there, I did a one, one session where, you know, I talked about it. It was, went on for about an hour or 40 minutes. They asked questions at the end. But the questions I got asked, especially with these year, year 9 through year 11s, was nothing about football. Had nothing. They never asked one question about rugby league or, you know, the achievements I'd done or anything like that. Who was the best player that I played with or against? And not one of them asked a footy question. Like I said, it was just all about how did I feel with this? How, how did I help myself? And which is, to me, surprising, but also rewarding. Yeah, it just shows that someone in your position who's, who's done everything in the game, speaking to some kids at school that are, what, 15, 16, 17, it has such a big impact if you're able to talk about issues you've come across in your life and your career. Um, and that must be really rewarding because, you know, it probably hits home a little bit more with those kids if, if you're able to talk about being vulnerable, which is something that men sports people and particularly rugby league players who who live in this alpha male environment it's it's if they're able to show vulnerability that's the key to well, as you said earlier just 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 letting your guard down and, and solving these issues that you might have yeah but it's also known that you can trust the people around you that you've been vulnerable about because then you'll open up more and that will actually help you out even better in the you know in the short term and long term you know, that's where you build real, real true friendships. Uh, you know, I've still got good mates that I was, you know, one of my good mates back home, we've been friends since year two, and we are still friends today. We're good, we're, you know, best of mates. And, you know, there's another two guys that are really good friends with as well. And we still, we got our little, I've got my little group of friends back home, and, you know, they, they know what I go through, and we sit down and we talk, and, you know, whenever we can, and, um, you know, a couple of weeks ago, like, I found it a bit hard being over here away from family, away from friends, and all it took was just a phone call and you know FaceTime back home, and you know I was all good. I just needed to see familiar faces from you know from being over here, and you know it's just it does come. It's just recognising when it does come. It's like what you do about it and how you react about it, instead of just going down to the bottle shop, which is you know you can pick up from a cert. Well, we just call it gas station here. They're you everywhere. Know, you gas, yeah, the gas station. <laughs> yeah, you know, you call, I, I don't know what you call it. We, we call it a survey. So it's a service station back home. But, 
you know, it's um, it's a petrol. So, a petrol so station, it's just Greg. petrol station. <laughs> yeah. Um, but yeah, it's just you know, it's it's a, little, it's a lot easier now. We're in the past. A couple of years ago, I probably just went. We went straight down and bought a bottle, sat at home, drunk a bottle of, you know, bottle of red, a bottle of vodka, and rocked in the train the next day. Like nothing happened. Where now it's actually hitting it on head, knowing what you're going through and ringing, like I've touched on before, ringing my friends back home and seeing familiar faces and, you know, get a better night's sleep. Greg, it's really interesting. And I remember, well, I've watched a few interviews with Shane Richardson. I know he's been a big part of your life at South Sydney Rabbitohs. And there was a time when he helped you get into an institution, into a mental health institution. And there is a stigma around mental health institutions as well. What, what was that like for you going in there? And, and I guess at first you kind of see all these films, don't you? And it, it, I can think of a million films in Hollywood where someone goes in there and they don't feel like they belong there or they can't adapt to it. And then you sort of walked away from other people doing the sessions. Did it help you? Was that a sort of um, a poignant moment for you? Well, he was a guy that, you know, that was, that I spoke about. You know, I didn't say his name, but he was the guy that actually said, Greg, there's actually something going, you know, that's underlining fact here. Um, the first stint that I had in rehab, I didn't, I walked away, I was sitting in there for three weeks and just not going to therapy rooms or therapy classes. And I was like, this, this shit's not for me. I'm, I'm not this person. Like, yeah, I know there's something, something wrong, but it's not this deep. It's bullshit. And I just didn't learn anything about myself or learn anything about what was going on in, you know, just in this in this headspace, in this space of you know, mental health. And it wasn't until the next one before I went there, he's, we sat down and he said, mate, there's something that, something really wrong going on here. I'm going to recommend you to you know, this, this other rehab clinic. And when I walked into this one, it was like, all right, I feel much better. I feel much at, at peace and at ease with myself. And that's when I actually allowed myself to be vulnerable, you know, just actually being open, honest. And, you know, I was going into the group group classes, group therapy, and, you know, hearing other people's stories, I was like, fuck, actually, I'm not alone here. So like, this is actually making me feel better. So then once I got that connection with the group, it was, it was just being, you know, spoke about how I felt, spoke about, you know, the real underlying issue of what I was thinking, you know, what like I spoke about, I never told anyone about the pres- prescription drugs and drinking until I black out, until I pass out and don't remember a thing. So, you know, where now I'm happy, happy to talk about it, in, you know, in any which way, as long as, I have, you know, look, I just want to pass on what I've experienced and hopefully it helps other people in this world. Greg, Greg, I mean, look, we will move because I wasn't planning to do a whole sort of 40 minutes, but it's just so fascinating to listen, you, to, listen to you talk about this. Um, one, one more looking back and then I promise we're looking forward. Uh, bipolar 2 has, has the highest rate of suicide. It's, it's the highest suicide risk listening to professionals talk about it. How, how close have you come to that crossing your mind? And, and for people listening who've been through those situations, what you know would you say to those guys and girls? I wouldn't say it was, you know, it's, it got to a, a point where I was like, uh, what's the point? You know, what what's the point of doing this? I'm just, I'm over it. I wouldn't say over life. I was just, I didn't want to end my life. I was just like, oh, fuck, you know, I just couldn't be bothered. Couldn't be bothered with anything anymore. And, you know, I just kept, I kept in that cycle and I, who I don't know. I don't know if my friends friends know, my family know. You know, I could have been gone in that, you know, by by the end of that week, so to speak. Could have been gone by, you know, overnight. But, you know, if I would have kept in that cycle, you know, who? I, it's just, it's hurt. It's hurting me thinking about it now, and it's it's pretty shit when you're in that. When you're actually in that space of mine, and but I've never been there, and on as it crossed my mind a little bit, but I wouldn't say I've had suicide thoughts. All I like I said just then is I just said what what's the fuck's the point? There's no point. 
never ever thought of, you know, ending my life at an early age. It was just, I think that's when it really kicked in, is like I actually really need to go and have a good three week stint in rehab. But anyone who's, I can't encourage people enough, if you're feeling like this, go seek help. Find out there's always help lines, there's always a clinic around that's close by. It's not too far of a drive because it, was, it is becoming a big issue, you know, in, in the world right now. And I just can't, you know, can't encourage you enough to actually go seek help for it. And, you know, once you do, just take it all in and, you know, just take all the information you can about any issues that you think you have, but also reaching out and connecting with, with other people that you do trust. Powerful stuff, Greg. Um, look, how how have you found the balance now in your life? Because I know you're you're a happy man, um, and look, now you've got a whole another adventure ahead of you. But that balance is so important for you, especially with your condition. Yeah, it's um, it's having the routine in your life and knowing what you want to do, uh, you know, day to day basis. But also, learn don't overcommit to things. Just having that balance, you know. Of, my partner's found a few horses over here because, you know, she's in the horse riding. So, you know, that's, that breaks it up from being, you know, so focused on 40 to actually going around and, you know, having time away and not thinking about anything. But, you know, just this big 600-kilo horse that you can jump on and fall off and probably break your arm or your pelvis or something. But, uh, you know, there's something about animals. There's something about the that horses. we got four horses back home on property and, you know, they just seem to be soothing and calming for me. So, you know, I'll, in the mornings when I do make the feeds up back home, I'll just sit there with a coffee and just sit at the fence and just watch them for, you know, for a good half hour. And it's just, it's very, it helps, it's very th- therapeutic for, for myself. And I could, like I keep saying, I can only speak for myself, but it's very therapeutic for myself. And it just also breaks up that work life balance and helps me out a lot. You know, when, when it is time to apply yourself for it, well then, yeah, go go ahead. And but when you step away from your workplace, just make sure you're actually really stepping away from it, and have a really good home life. And you know, I'll just feel feel more at ease and feel happy, to to be honest. Yeah, it's, the thing is, the horse doesn't know who you are, Greg. It's probably one of the only things <laughs> in the world that doesn't know who you are. That's that's the point. <laughs> So I, oh, I take my nice. dogs out in the morning because there's no judgment. They have no idea about the shit that I've been up to. You know what I mean? So, yeah. for, you know, that, that form of escapism, <laughs> though, is, is really important. Like, like it's creating separation in your life from your job and your personality and your family and having separation in your life is, is, is so important. Like, and, you know, I just, look, I, I've enjoyed having a professional career, but the profile I got to is, 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 it was not high enough where it was ever an issue for me. But for, for somebody like for Greg, who, you know, his shadow is that big. It follows him around all the time. You know what I mean? You can't escape being Greg Inglis in Australia. Yeah, me and Greg like, both struggle with that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, you can't escape being Will Perry either, unfortunately. Yeah, yeah look, it's... um. Yeah. What also helped me is, like, because, like I said, I moved away from home at 15, 16... So when I retired and when I was coming to the back end of my career, because I was solely focused on on league back home, it was as soon as I retired, I went back home. I went back home and got in touch with with my culture, with, with my country, and you know, sitting around with friends and that on on you know, they three of them own hun- over 140 plus acres hectares back home. So we just go home, go up there, just sit, chill, no service on the phones, no nothing. So. Fresh waters, go fishing, um, and just sitting back and riding motorbikes and being a kid again. And Mate, it sound, that just sitting so around that flashes, flashes nodding his head because he knows I, I'd be all <laughs> over that one. A flash. Just, <laughs> he got you a phone signal. That's no, all he needed phone, to say no to phone you. Phone signal. I'm, I'm getting, no phone signal. Yeah, no phone signal. No nothing unless we go. You know, we go hunting for deer and that in the right season. So, you know, it's just being back home and being reconnected and reconnecting with you know my my country you know because it's so important for my culture to be um, connecting with your culture and where you're from so you know being back home and you know it's 
all my friends that live live back there and you know it's just taken a long time to get back there and ever since i've been back there it's i feel more we will keep touching on more at ease within myself mm. and look it's good it's going to be refreshing for you greg isn't it because you've come over here and the fact that you can't walk down the street in whether it's sydney or melbourne back in the day without being harassed you know you'll be able to go into manchester and people gary and janet as we call them will just look at you and be like he's a big guy isn't he don't know who he is that that will be nice for you yeah there's a few um few fans in my street but they just walk past say hello and what not having you know too many conversation which which you know which i don't mind it saves me talking to my partner every <laughs> every time i get home and trying trying to keep up with conversations with her and i'm pretty sure she feels the same way with me um but yeah, it's, um, look, we we got great neighbours, and you know they've been Warrington fans. I don't know ever since they moved into the area. So you know it's just it's not so much in your face, um, you know. But it's also it's also good to actually sit back and talk to you know um, leaguey fans over anywhere. You've got to stop wearing your tracksuit, mate. That's what's giving you up. <laughs> you, did you, you bring any clothes with you, or are you oh, just no, wearing I'm, your Warrington I'm, kit? I'm, I don't think it's the tracks. I think it's when I walk out on sunny days, it's because I'm sick of wearing trackies. It's short. So I was like, oh, he must be the bloke from Australia or something. So. <laughs> but no, Look, it's, um, Greg, uh, we, 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 always have, um, we always have question time on uh, our Out of Your League podcast. So uh, Mark is on, on 10% battery, unfortunately, or fortunately, depending which way you look at it. So if he drops off, it's Six, not the no. worst thing in the world and we might be able to finish up. 6%. <laughs> we're we're going to lose him soon. Uh, but time for question time. This is where, you know, you guys can put your questions uh, at out of your RL on Twitter. Uh, Dom Bolger says, if the rumour is true regarding the exiles coming back in 2021, would you stick your hand up and be involved? For the exiles? Yeah. Um, Does he know who the exiles are? This is the next question. Is that, the, is that like the barbarians? <laughs> like just a mixture yeah, of uh, are, yeah. players? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, most depends when depends what's when in the season it's going to be played. Uh, we'll be, we'll <laughs> we'll be about the money. It wouldn't be about money. <laughs> no, 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 well, no. Well, look, uh, that's, a good, enough, that's a good point to bring that in because it. It's no, but it's not. It's not about the money, is it? You're not actually getting paid. You're not a marquee signing. It's not about money, 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 is it? This no, no. It's not about money. It's like what we said at the start of the podcast. It's about being over and enjoying the experience, but also adding value to the club and the younger players that's that's around here. You know, yes, I want to get back to playing footy and I want to put my best foot forward, but you no, know, it was just. It's not. It's nowhere near about the money. It's just about having the experience of playing here in the league and get the travel at the same time. Yeah. Not too many I'll play people for back home. <laughs> Not too many back <laughs> people back home play you're back talking home. To, you're talking to that. a mercenary in Wilkin, though. That's the thing. You've got <laughs> a mercenary there in that green hat. <laughs> Hold on a minute. Will Perry. Mercenary. Will Perry, right? Greg, just so you don't know, Will Perry will cover for any TV presenter that's out of work. Like if somebody has two weeks off, Will Perry will be on the telly. Trust me. <laughs> anyway back to the questions look Dom there's some serious ones some stupid ones Dom also asks how has the announcement of Steve Price leaving at the end of the season affected you and the team oh look if it's done anything well then it'll I think it's just driven the squad and and driven uh, Pricey um, to be quite honest I think he really wants to leave on a good note and you know there's obviously no bad blood but you know I think he's been disappointed with, with himself and but you know, you also got to think he's been over for four years now, and his young, his girls are growing up and getting to that age of going back into high school and whatnot. So, you know, I think him coming out and saying it now it just clears his mind and knowing where he's going to be at the end of the year, so he can actually put his best foot forward. And you know, he does have the respect for the squad um, without a doubt. And you know, it's just unfortunate the last two years they just you know we we just finished you know third or fourth. I've got a question, Will. I'm quite interested to know where uh, Greg expects to play and where would he like to play because he's, he's played every, every position in the back line. So where does he expect to be playing and where would he like to be playing? You should have tweeted that question be... in, Mark. <laughs> expect to be playing in the centre and I'm happy to play at centre. You know, we got a, you know, you guys would have seen young Matty Ashton coming through and playing fullback last year. Um, I think he's got exceptional talent and, 
Um, you know, with Steph there as well. Um, you know, I think he's got a. I think Matty Ashton's got you know a good um, utmost respect, and you know can actually learn from Steph over from here anyway. So, you know, I'll just leave them two to run around. Like you know, I'm not 24 years old anymore. Um, so I can't it's just a lot keep of running back, and back isn't it? It is a lot of running, and I don't, I don't, I don't think I've got the body weight to hold it for for this amount of games in a season like like these two blokes do. There's there's 24 centres in Super League of just shit the pants. By the way, <laughs> <laughs> Greg's, Greg's, his his right arm is just going to be doing an all this. <laughs> yeah. Nah, well, Logan, Wilkin, we, um, Wilkins been on. Have, have you have you boys all played against each other? John, I know you have. Mark, have you played against me in the NRL? Yeah, Tigers? World World Club Challenge 2015, Club. and then I think yeah, yeah, I think at the uh, NRL in 10 or 11. Yeah, I, well, played against Greg. We had a, a chat about this offline just before we came on about the 2011 Four Nations final. When I mentioned it, Greg didn't even, you know, in the top thousand things of cool shit he's done, he's not even in the top thousand. He was like looking around, yeah, yeah, 2011, the Four Nations final. Was that the one where we beat you? And that's your well, greatest not, day, isn't it? Yeah, Greg, uh, Greg scored a try in the 65th minute in that in in that game, which actually sealed it for Australia. But I was I was opposite a teammate of Greg Sam Thider, and just just saying before about tackling, he was like he is a chode, so he's as wide as he's tall. He's like a Swiss ball, a Swiss ball with really strong arms and legs. So I just got bumped around the field by him all day. I didn't have a, a lot of fun that night. Well, that that might answer this question because the Saint has tweeted in uh, to say. Does Greg know who Wilkin and Flash are? Flash, by the way, is Mark's nickname, Greg. So be honest, yes, before today yes. when John was saying, <laughs> no, like, yes, oh, I do. look at me, I remember the, the no. Four Nations. No, 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 even, if, even, if, even if he did or didn't, he couldn't admit He couldn't admit that he didn't, <laughs> could he? Can. This, it's like, this it's is an the, awful this is the question. platform to admit oh, it. Now. Or if I'd admit it and say that they're terrible players. I think the whole point of the way pretty much it is, is, you know, being being honest with, with people, you know, that, but yes, I, I do remember and I do know and I have played. Okay. Played. Nice. Well, look, next, yeah, yeah, yeah. Look how happy they are. <laughs> uh, this one from, uh, this one from Chris Callard, by the way, my name's Will Greg. So this one will help you out in this one. Will Mark John snog, marry, avoid. <laughs> you have to explain these terms. Snog, marry, avoid. You've got snog one, marry one and avoid one, Greg. It's not rocket science. Oh, I don't think way you just put it. I don't, I don't think you had a breath. I don't think you had a breath within that sentence. Um, <laughs> snug one. Yeah, it'd be faz. Um, <laughs> marry one. We'll go. And, oh, come you know, on, Greg. Don't be nasty. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Um, Kai Robbo says, "Can uh, like, be careful what you say yes to now." Kai Robbo says, "Can you come down and do a training session with my Wollstone Rovers under sevens, please?" <laughs> oh, um, you can't say no. Greg. A, I have to run a bite a club. <laughs> <laughs> uh, this is a good one, Paul Swift. Are we going to see an English adaptation to the Goana celebration? Yeah, it might turn into a into a slug where you just slide and you just stay face planted <laughs> down and just roll into a fence. That's a, that's only like thirty centimeters from the dead bull line. So. What what was the ultimate English animal though that you could, if you're going to do a celebration like that? What is it? It'd be the something slug. like really. <laughs> no, it'd be like a red setter or something, a border collie, <laughs> a border collie. Um, I wouldn't have a clue to be quite honest. I wouldn't have a clue. Uh, here we go. A couple more from uh, from the guys who've been tweeting in. Danny Batley, what's your strangest locker room experience, Greg? Strangest locker room? Uh, are we we got to keep it PG, don't we? No, 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 no. There's no PG here. Oh, far out. <laughs> There's been some strange ones, if he's going that deep into <laughs> memory banks. <laughs> there has. There, there has been. Um, I don't... Oh. I don't know if this is... It's got something to do with what, ice, on, cube ice cube in okay, the shower. Ice cube in the shower? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, just leave it at that if you want. Yeah, that's not what the, I'm not saying. The, not the actor. No, it was... Um, 
Ice yeah. Cube did a rap session in the shower. I could imagine there yeah. was an Ice Cube there one minute and it wasn't there the next minute. Yeah. But where did yeah, it go? Pretty much. And, but then, but then <laughs> yeah. it disappeared and it appeared again in like within a split seconds. <laughs> <laughs> but we'll just leave it at that. That was probably the, yeah, that was probably the weirdest thing I've, I've seen. <laughs> that was the 12 version. We'll get the uh, we'll get the 18 version later. And Kieran Jones just finally says, any secret second nationalities that would enable a World Cup swan song? Well, I've been out of the game for two years and coming back. You just don't know. Might, might bring up Wayne, see if I can get in the UK side. Great Britain. <laughs> oh, there we go. Man, anybody nah, can get right. in the island, in the <laughs> island team. You can just pretend. <laughs> nah, my, my, my rep days are gone. They're, they're, um, <laughs> body wouldn't be able to hide right. at the end of the year. Greg, we do, we do, we've kept you so long, so we're going to finish with a quick fire round, okay, just to finish off this week. And I need a yep, quick response, please, Mr. English. Remember that there is no right and wrong answer. You will not be judged. Uh, you do not have to say anything, but it may harm your defence if you do not mention when questioned something you have later uh, rely on in court. Anything you do say may be given in evidence. Do you understand, Mr. English? Yes, sir, we'll do. Play on. <laughs> <laughs> okay, here we go. Quick fire. Greg, would you rather be a toad or a pig? Toad. Favourite cheese? Cheddar. Solid. What's your best feature? Lips. Did you say hips? Who would win? <laughs> lips. <laughs> oh, lips. Lips. <laughs> Stop interrupting him, you two. Would you, so, who would win in a fight, you or Israel Falau? <laughs> Me, back myself. Would you be more scared of a horse-sized duck or a duck-sized horse? Or a duck-sized horse. How often is it healthy to cry? Whenever you feel sad. Would you rather be bald or ginger? Bald. <laughs> <laughs> <They're bald. laughs> yeah, we've got a ball Jim's there. Grand, Sorry, good ginger guys listening. Absolutely fuming. If you had to die, would you rather drown or fall from a great height? Neither. Favorite childhood TV show? Simpsons. Would you rather have an arm for an ear or an ear for an arm? None. <laughs> <laughs> what sound does an ostrich make? Whatever sound it is, I've never heard one. Would you have been a rugby union star if you'd switched codes? Play union through all through high school. Played six years of it. <laughs> that's a yes. <laughs> that's a yes. Yeah, that's a yes. <laughs> Would you rather come face to face with a miniature hippopotamus or a giant cockroach? Both are in a very bad mood. Ah, cockroach. You have to save one Burgess brother from a burning building. You have to watch all the others perish through the window. Who would you save? Um, I'll save Sammy because he's going through pretty much that right now. Would you rather lose all of your hair or keep your hair and lose your little finger? Uh, keep my hair, lose my finger. You have to sleep with Boris Johnson or Kim Jong-un to save your family's lives. Who's it going to be, Greg? Um, I'll say with Kim Jong-un because he's a bit frightening. <laughs> you, you never know. Why can't you, never we... know you never know what he's going to do. To be fair, well, I think that's all of our choice. That would be my choice too. Can you imagine <laughs> Boris Johnson. Oh my god. Uh, why, why, <laughs> why can't we tickle ourselves, Greg? Why can't we what? Tickle ourselves. You can if you get the right spot. <laughs> would you have given up your rugby career to have won two Olympic gold medals? Uh, nope. No. Was Michael Jackson guilty, yes or no, Greg? No. If you could steal something from Russell Crowe's house, what would it be? 
Quad bikes. Nice. <laughs> quad bikes, plural. He's got more than one. Bikes. <laughs> bikes. <laughs> Just to finish here, Greg, you have to sacrifice one of your new Warrington teammates or else you will all die. Who do you slaughter? Who do you? Who do I slaughter? Oh. Now nah, we're, we're one in all in, so we'll all, we'll all take the sacrifice and go down. <laughs> what a team player. Um, Greg, there we go. Very weird way to, to end the podcast. And we've lost Mark Flanagan as well, which is fantastic. His battery's gone. Hopefully his battery's gone for the rest of the series. Uh, <laughs> yes, but please. Greg, in all, in all seriousness, mate, thank you so much for coming on and speaking so openly. I'm sure, you know, just people listening to you, you're going to help thousands and thousands of people. And, and look, have a, a mega season. I'm sure we'll see you at some stage. Thank you. No worries. Thanks for having us. Be yeah, all the best, Greg. Uh, thank you guys for listening to uh, Out of Your League the big guests will keep on coming remember we'll have a new episode uh, episode for you every week available to download from wherever you get your podcasts and you can watch all of the episodes from years gone by on YouTube don't forget to give us a follow on Twitter as well at Out of Your RL be seeing you <laughs>